Hello, hello, it's Steve Bartlett again. Really excited about today's lesson. I hope again that you'll have a manual where you can look along with me and look at some of the things that we've written here to help you. Uh, there's no way that I could have the first lesson or manual on evangelism and not talk about the actual work of an evangelist. And today I'm going to use a few Greek words. I hope that doesn't throw anybody off too much. But uh, boy, we've got an important study. And actually, it's in 2 Timothy 4, 5 that God commands us to do the work of an evangelist. I, I really believe with all my heart that if you'll get a hold of what we go over today, it will change your ministry and make you more effective than you've ever been. In the book of Titus, Titus chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says that God has manifested his word through preaching. I want you to think about that. How does God make his word come alive? How does he reveal his word to the human race? It's through preaching. What is the work of an evangelist? The work of an evangelist is to preach the gospel. It's amazing. So many people in our generation have a, have a bad view of preaching, and we feel like we don't want to preach. We want to do nice things for people, and somehow they're going to get saved. There's a hilarious story I heard many years ago, and actually Kenneth Copeland shared it on one of the broadcasts that I saw, and he said that someone had written in to him, and they were giving a story about what happened on their job. And this guy tried to live his witness. He wanted to live his Christianity in front of his fellow workers. And literally for years, year after year after year, he was going to live out his faith because he didn't want to say anything about Jesus. He didn't want to offend anybody. So he was just going to live his witness out. And finally, after a number of years, somebody says to him, man, I see something different about you. And it was in the lunchroom. And you know what the guy said to him? Are you a vegetarian? True story. Are you a vegetarian? Years of living out his Christianity. And the only thing that this other guy noticed that was different about him is he'd never seen him eat any meat at his lunches. Listen, guys, if we don't open our mouths and proclaim the gospel and preach the gospel, no one is going to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Do you realize that the gospel's power is manifested or released through preaching? If I'm silent, the bottom line is no one's going to be saved. Why do you think it is that Jesus said, go into all the world and preach, proclaim, open your mouth if, if, until we're preaching the gospel? There is no real conversion, no real transformation in people's lives. You know, the Bible says that the gospel is the power of God and that the word of God is the power of God and that preaching releases the word of God. Listen to this. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross releases God's power to save those who will believe. Proclamation evangelism is real evangelism. I'm not against doing nice things for people, going and cleaning up yards and handing out water and feeding the poor and doing coat drives. Listen, I ran a mission for years in Chicago. We gave out thousands of coats. I've, I've given out th tens of of thousands of meals. But you know what? Nobody ever got saved eating a Christian sandwich. It's just that simple. The word kerygma is a noun, and it means the official message of a king's herald. 
There's a reason I want to give you a couple of Greek words here. Kerygma. It's the message that's preached. For an evangelist, the kerygma is the gospel. Again, there's a reason I'm going to do this. It's the content of the preaching. Listen to this statement. I'm in 1 Corinthians 1, 21 to 23. Since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom didn't know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the kerygma, the message preached to save those who believe. Could you imagine that? Through the foolishness of the message preached, God saves those who believe. And here you have the word kerygmatos, the proclamation, the uh, stating that the gospel is the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I've given you a historical survey of ancient times in your manual here. And I want you to understand this. The kerux is the one that proclaims the kerygma. You can hear how the words sort of go together. The kerux is the representative of the king in ancient world. And in the ancient world, the king, they doesn't have the internet like we do today. The king, to get his message out, would literally have an entire army of messengers. Could you imagine when Rome wanted to make a proclamation throughout the entire empire, Caesar would get together all of his caruxes, and he would tell them the message that they would go and disseminate throughout the empire. How does Almighty God get his message to spread throughout the entire world? The carux, the preacher, proclaims the kerygma, the message. Now, I'll tell you why this is so critical and important, and I'm not trying just to throw Greek words at you to somehow give whatever I'm going to say today more authority. I want you to really get this. The Karux is given a message by the king. The Karux doesn't choose the message. He doesn't have the right to either preach the message or not preach the message. He was commissioned by the king to go out with the message. And again, without, without you know, being too, too um, I don't know, crazy here, let me just say this. The gospel is a message sent by the king of kings to the human race. We, we don't have the option, if we want to or not, say the gospel to people, because just like in ancient times, what do you think would happen to a town when Caesar sent his karuks and said, this is what I want to happen? Do you know why Jesus was born in the town of Nazareth? Because the karuks sent the message that all of Israel will be taxed. Where did the descendants of Joseph go to pay their taxes? Think about this for a minute. Are we more interested in what a tax collector says than Almighty God? And let me ask you, what do you think Rome would have done, the Roman Empire, to a city that refuses to pay its taxes? How long do you think they would have put up with that? It's amazing. God is using an illustration here. And, and I want you to get this. The gospel, God's message, the kerygma, the gospel message, only comes by oral proclamation. Now, I realize that people have gotten born again off of the internet and through books and that kind of thing. But in the ancient world, the karuks had a job. He is the representative of the king. And what he says literally is as the words of the king. Do you realize the incredible privilege we have as gospel preachers? When I stand in a park or on a street 
or on a, on a platform in a foreign country, and I proclaim the good news, do you realize it is though God himself were actually there proclaiming his message? Again, something I've already shared with you, and T.L. Osborne used to say this to us all the time, God is a spirit. He needs your flesh. <laughs> what, what, what's the issue there with this, this gospel proclamation? Well, the king is looking for workers that will take his message and to go into all the world. See, let me ask you, what is the work of an evangelist but to deliver the message that was given to them by the king? And you know what's interesting, on the top of page 54, I have a statement here, and I want you to really think about it. The preacher is both the deliverer of the message, and yet at the same time, he is the message. You can't separate the two. This is why it's so important that we live what we say we live. If we're a hypocrite, who's going to listen to a religious hypocrite, even though they might have the right message in the sense that they're delivering something that's true. Preachers are the divinely appointed means for the visible expression and even the expansion of the kingdom of God. If you and I are afraid to preach the gospel. It means people won't be saved. Right now, I'm coming to you from, from Colorado. I'm an I'm instructor here at Karis Bible College, but for ambassadors for Christ, I want, to I want to train you to be effective in your gospel sharing. Can you tell me what percentage of Christians in our generation today, have ever shared their faith? The answer is 7%. We get that from doing all kinds of surveys and statistics. How many Christians do you think actually know that Jesus has commanded his church to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation? And yet, what percentage actually obey him and take the gospel into all the world? Do you want to know why the United States is in the shape it's in today? Because for three generations, the church has basically not shared their faith. What happens to a generation of people where no one shares their faith? And then the next generation comes up, and the vast majority of people don't know a thing about God, and that generation of the church doesn't share its faith. And then we do it again. This is why America has taken the turn that it has away from God, and away from Christ, and away from morality, and going in the direction that it has. The bottom line is, guys, we are ambassadors for Christ. We are keruxes that have been given a message to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the love and the goodness and the power of God to a watching world. You know, in ancient days, and this is a true story, in ancient days, when the karux didn't deliver his message for whatever reason it is, do you realize that, and this is again a true story, entire towns were wiped out by either the Greek or the Roman army. The entire town didn't get the message. They didn't know what they were supposed to do. And somehow, either the, the emperor or the king or the magistrate in that area was upset and literally entire cities were leveled to the ground because people didn't get the message or people didn't listen to the message when the Karuks came. Can you think about the responsibility that we have in this world? Let me ask you something. If people don't turn to Jesus, 
What's going to be the end result of that? And if preachers don't go and preach the gospel message, what's going to be the end of that? See, the bottom line is we've been given the call to do the work of an evangelist. An evangelist opens his mouth and proclaims the good news. The gospel is the power of God that results in salvation. But if I don't preach the gospel, if I don't unleash the gospel, the gospel doesn't do anybody any good. Again, the Karuks has a job. You know, it's interesting. We must recognize our obligation to accept the responsibility. Listen, within the urgency of time. There's going to be a time when, when literally for people, for a multitude of people, they step into eternity and it's over for them. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I'm just informing you of the facts. Suppose there's a bunch of corn out in a field and the farmer's tractor breaks down, and he never gets to reap his harvest, what's going to happen to the harvest? It simply rots in the field. And right now, we're looking at a harvest on a worldwide basis, and for you and I, this is our generation. What happened in the previous generations, we can't control. This is our time. We have been entrusted with the gospel message. I want to just read to you some of the words that I find in the Bible to convey the meaning of what it means to be a karux or a preacher of the gospel. Listen to these words. Declaration or to declare. An announcement or to announce a pronouncement, a decree, an edict. All of these are biblical words that describe what a karuk does. To bear witness, to preach, to make known, to evangelize, to communicate, to prophesy. In other words, to verbally speak. I have a lesson in one of the other manuals that I'll be doing with you where you're going to be amazed how many words the apostles found to convey the idea of oral communication. Preaching is both an appeal and it's a proclamation. If, if I have no passion in my proclamation, then, then no one's going to be moved to make a decision and to do any change. When the Karux comes and he's passionate about what he's saying, everyone understands the urgency that that man or woman has in their proclamation, and they make a decision. One time, back in Tulsa, there was a flood. And there was a, a, a time where a road had washed out. And I remember a car was driving down that road at the regular speed, and I had already gotten to the point where I realized that the road was out. And I can tell you this. Do you think I was able to wave that car down by just saying, stop, stop? Or did I get out in the middle of the street and wave my arms and stop them from just literally driving into a river? See, there's an urgency that's got to go with our proclamation. Because that's the job of the Karuks. It's not just to deliver the message. It's to convey the urgency of the message. What Jesus is looking for is men and women that aren't ashamed of the gospel. Because they realize the gospel is the power of God. But in their own lives, they've been affected by the gospel. And they realize with all the passion and urgency that they can convey that the gospel is the only hope for men and women that are lost in this world. See, that's the job. That's the assignment of an evangelist. It's, it's the very work of an evangelist to make 
God real and the appeal real to people because we have the greatest message there is. You know, on the middle of page 55, listen to this statement. The Karutz's voice is as the voice of the ruler. Could you imagine this? How does God speak today in the world? Is there a booming voice out of heaven? Or does God send men and women filled with love and compassion, men and women that have been transformed by this message? Those are the ones he sends back out into the world. And see, that's what a karux is. Someone that's been affected. Someone who realizes the urgency. Someone whose own life is, is, is part of this message that we share. You see, the voice of the Karuks is the only voice the people are going to hear. Caesar Augustus didn't go to the Rome, you know, throughout the Roman Empire trying to declare his own message. He sent Karukses throughout the empire. They were the very voice of Caesar. And how is it any different today? The reason the world is in the shape it's in. The reason entire regions of the world are lost is because the Karukses simply haven't gone and proclaimed the gospel message. We are the only hope of the world. And what is the work of an evangelist? To proclaim, to preach, to declare, even to demonstrate the gospel message everywhere we go. And it, it wouldn't be right for me to teach you a bunch of facts and yet not let you have this understanding for me to fail. It means that people won't be saved. See, for the Karuks to fail, it means that the town won't know what the king has decreed and declared. And I want you to know something. The, the, the Karuks doesn't choose his message he faithfully declares the message that was given to him. You and I have no right. That's why last in our last study, I was asking you, what's real conversion? Do we have a right just to talk people into praying a prayer without making a heartfelt decision? <clears throat> it might be easier for you to get someone to pray a prayer with you, but that doesn't mean that you faithfully delivered the message that the king is challenging you to deliver, and that is that they need to repent and put their faith in the Lord Jesus and follow him in water baptism and to begin to obey him in the fellowship of the Christian community. You see, real Christianity is what we're after, guys. And again, as I, and I've written this on the top of page 56, the Karuks doesn't choose his message, doesn't choose the parts of the message that he likes. He delivers the whole message because it's God's message. And I want you to know something. When you deliver God's message, the Holy Spirit is going to confirm it with signs and wonders and miracles that follow the preaching of the word. And I really believe the reason we see so few signs and wonders is because God can't confirm a message that really isn't his message. Now, how's that for a thought? If we want to see supernatural, biblical Christianity, it's time that we got back to the message that God has delivered to the church, how Jesus Christ came to this earth, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was born of a virgin. He lived up and or lived and grew up here in this world and chose to serve the living God. He went to the cross for our sins and died in our place on the cross, paying the price and, and literally opening the door for humanity to be saved. He was buried, and on the third day he rose again. You see, what is the gospel message? It's the message about the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
and if I will faithfully proclaim and preach the gospel. The Bible says it's the gospel that's the power of God unto salvation. And again, with just a few minutes that we have left, I, I want you to think about it. Gospel preaching will be accompanied by signs and wonders and miracles. God confirms his message with the gifts of the Spirit, with divine healing, with the casting out of devils, with supernatural manifestations of God's power. The Bible says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 20 that they went out and preached everywhere. They proclaimed the gospel everywhere. And listen to this phrase, and the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs and wonders following. If you and I would be faithful to what Jesus did, we would see the same results in our ministry because God has filled us with the same Holy Spirit. Listen, I want you to think about this. I serve the same God the Apostle Paul did. I have the same promises in the Bible that the Apostle Paul had. I've been baptized with the same Holy Spirit. I've been entrusted with the same gospel message. I have all the same promises, all the same, you know, moving of God's Spirit in, in us today that they had at, at literally in the first century. What's going to be the difference? The real question is, will I proclaim the gospel faithfully? Will I do the work of an evangelist and then have enough faith to step out? and to pray for people in Jesus' name where I would see signs and wonders and miracles following. I've listed here on, on the last couple of pages of this outline, pages 50 and 60, listen to this. In the New Testament, proclamation was always more than verbal communication. It always involved a physical demonstration that our message is of divine origin and by demonstration of the Spirit of God. Our mission, and I put, should you choose to accept it, is to present Jesus alive by many infallible proofs. In other words, I'm convincing, I'm, I'm, I'm refuting, and I'm bringing undeniable evidence like the lame man being healed in Acts chapter 3, that this message is supernatural in its origin and its nature and its power. And what God did for them in Bible days, God will do for us today in the world that we live in right now. You see, the work of an evangelist is to be faithful and proclaim the message that God has given us. But it's to even go farther and to show people that Jesus is resurrected from the dead. Listen to Acts 4.33. With great power and ability, the apostles were continually testifying to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, they weren't just proclaiming the resurrection, they were demonstrating the resurrection. You see, it's proclamation the preaching of the gospel with a power demonstration that was always the New Testament power or pattern. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, not just to preach, but to go around healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Oh man, I don't have time today to go over all these verses. I just want you to know something. If you're faithful in your gospel preaching and your presentation, that the Spirit of God is going to anoint you to give you a powerful demonstration of the gospel. I've seen this many, many hundreds of times. If you'll preach the gospel, the power of God will go into work. People will be converted. Miracles will happen. And lives will be transformed because we weren't afraid 
We didn't shrink back from declaring the gospel of God. Listen, it's been great to be with you today. Take some time and study these lessons. You too can be a faithful Karuts that brings to your king a mighty harvest of souls. God bless you.